Lord Watson? That has a nice ring to it, doesn't it? Well, now it's a reality. I am now a lord. I own land in Scotland. And you could too. With established titles, you could take advantage of the Scottish custom where owners of land are referred to as lord or lady. Can't get in at that restaurant, tell them you're a lord, and they might just be able to accommodate you. I, I want to boost your profile on Tinder, tell them they're a lord, and you'll be right up for it. Want to get completely scammed, tell them you're a lord, and it'll be right up there, you know what I mean? Because uh, you really, really can't buy a Scottish lairdship. I cannot stress this enough. Hello, 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 and welcome to this edition of The Jolly Heretic. Now, today, I want to deviate away slightly from what I'm used to talking about, which is evolutionary psychology and stuff like that, uh, <coughs> which is to look at um, really my academic hobby, uh, and that is history. Now, I wrote a book some years ago called The Ruler of Cheshire, Sir Piers Dutton, Tudor Gangland, and the Violent Politics of the Palatine. And one of the things that this looked into was the history of nobility in England and, I, and in Britain more generally. And I cannot emphasise enough, you cannot buy a Scottish lairdship and establish titles and the various other uh, groups that sell these things. I first, I first saw an advert for in the back of Private Eye in 1996 or something, a title for a tenor it was called. Now they're charging considerably more for a square foot of land. It is a scam. Now there must be some level on which people that buy these things are not stupid, they know it's a scam, so why is it advertised as not being a scam? But before that, a quick word from our sponsor, which is not established titles, uh, it is a sponsor that actually offers something useful. Well, first, a word from our sponsor. Now, we are all truth seekers here at the Jolly Heretic Public House, but here's the problem, chaps. We can only get to the truth if we have multiple perspectives, if we have multiple interpretations, if we have access to the other side, if we have access to all viewpoints. Only then can we really understand what's going on in the world. And we are increasingly finding that we cannot do that. Information is blocked. Websites are blocked. Alternative perspectives are blocked. And so the only way around this, realistically, is some form of VPN. And as far as I can see, Atlas VPN gives you everything you can possibly need. There is currently a steel Black Friday deal going on in which you can get Atlas VPN Premium for just $1.70 per month plus six months extra with a 30-day money-back guarantee. This is the best VPN offer Atlas have ever done and it's a time-limited offer so it's it's time to get on with it, chaps. Uh, it has all kinds of benefits to Atlas VPN. It's, uh, you, as I say, there's this offer, of just uh, this, this, this brilliant offer. Uh, you can unlock your favourite content from all over the world. If you can't access your favourite programme or whatever, your Atlas VPN has got you covered. You can keep your Google searches secret and private using Atlas VPN. You can stop ads and malware. You can save money online. It will give you the get you, get you the best deals while shopping online and it will, it will all that kind of stuff. And you can protect unlimited devices using Atlas VPN. As I say, uh, there is a fantastic offer on at the moment uh, in which it's just uh, it's uh, $1.70 a, a month plus six months extra with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Guarantee. So this really is the, the cheapest and best way to get a VPN. We increasingly need VPNs. We are, we are, we are, the truth is blocked. The truth is covered up. We can't get access to information. And in a, in a, in a society that's doing this to us, uh, we need a VPN. And as far as I can see, Atlas VPN is, is where it's at, chaps. OK, so here we go then. What is this system, this idea? Well, you have groups such as established titles, which have been sponsoring numerous videos by Paul Joseph Watson and various other people. And what they seem to be saying is that you can, by, you can, by purchasing a square foot of land or some larger plot of land somewhere in Scotland, you can become a laird. Um, and and therefore you, which is a, a Scottish word meaning lord, uh, and therefore you can become a lord. That's it. That's the scam. That's the idea. That's the basic thing. And it's a lovely novelty idea uh, that, that through this that you can give someone a Christmas present or something, because Christmas is coming up, remember, uh, wh whereby they are a laird and therefore they are a lord. That's the idea. Right. Now, let's break this down. Um, it, is, it is, needless to say, absolutely untrue. The first reason why it is untrue is, uh, let's say, what a laird is. A laird is the officially recognised owner of a Scottish estate. That's what a laird is. When I was at university, a chap who, uh, when I was a postgraduate, whom I taught, was, uh, in, he was one of my tutees, was the laird of Knock Knock or some such place. So he had the right to put his name and then of Knock Knock because he was officially the laird of this place as recognised by the Lord Lion, who is the 
um, the official body that recognises titles and dignities and whatever in Scotland. So then the idea is that the word laird under Scots law also means the owner of the land, and that is true. So I've signed various contracts because I used to live in Scotland or, and rent things in Scotland, and the person that owns the land of whom you are a tenant is the laird. So that is in the same way that in Old English uh, 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 wording, the person that owns the land is the, the lord, i.e. the land lord. So it is in theory correct that if you own land in Scotland, you are a laird, but you are certainly not a lord, that's not the same thing. You are a laird in the sense that you own land in Scotland. So that's the, that's, that's, the, that's the fundamental idea. Now, before moving on any further, uh, let's look at why this absolutely doesn't make you anything even akin to a lord. And I look at this in, in my book here. How did the British, English and Scottish system of nobility develop? It developed via feudalism. You have a feudal system where the monarch is at the top and the tenant in chief holds land from the monarch. So he is, he is the highest level. The mesne tenant holds land from <coughs> the tenant-in-chief, and then various sub-tenants hold land from the mesne tenant. And this is how it was established in about 1066. What that gradually developed into was a system whereby many of the tenants-in-chief, not all of them, but many of the tenants-in-chief who were uh, richer, who had more land, and who were basically more powerful, that basically created a more powerful and important protection racket in which they controlled more of the country. Because remember, in those days, the king basically controlled London, and then outside of London, he was reliant on various lords or whatever, effectively very genteel protection rackets, to control the rest of the country. That was the system. And the idea was, you hold land from the king, and in return for that, at a time of war, he calls upon you to fight for him. And so you are the nobles, then, that are fighting for him. And so what these tenants-in-chief, in many cases, not all, but the ones that were more powerful and influential, developed into was the nobles, who in 1215, the barons and earls, who in 1215 were given seats in the House of Lords when Parliament was established. The people who held land from them, that's to say the Mesne tenants, what they developed into was the knights. So the nobles, the, the earls or barons, would be called upon to fight for their king in war and provide a certain number of knights, i.e. these people uh, who held the land as Mesne tenants. Now, some of these people um, uh, who, who were of that social class were not yet knighted because it, they developed the idea that you have to be knighted, you have to be dubbed by the monarch a knight. Uh, for some action, you know, fighting in battle or whatever it happens to be. And so the ones that weren't yet knighted, but were of that class, they became known as esquires um, and, 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 and gentlemen. And then, uh, that is to say, people didn't have to work for a living. And then below them, the ones that held land from them, from the esquires and from the knights, uh, they would be called the gentlemen, um, if they didn't have to work for a living, or if they did some farming themselves, the yeomen and then or the husbandman and it depended on the, the amount of farming work they did and, the, and their sort of status in society so that was the system now what eventually happened was that as i say the, the, the tenants in chief most a lot of them became the nobility the the, the major nobles and the the uh, the the, the, the mesne tenants became what, what the knights and then that developed into what's called the gentry and the gentry was a social class that was in, in some ways kind of uh, it depends who you read they're commoners and and they're kind of between the ordinary people, as it were, the, the plebeians uh, and the patricians. And according to some 16th century documents, they would say oh, they are kind of the lower nobility. They are the lower nobility uh, of, of, of England, whereas the peerage, with the, the peerage only passing to the oldest son, remember, so then the rest become gentry, uh, with the peerage being the major nobles and the minor nobles being the gentry. <clears throat> The gentry itself then delineates um, into the uh, into armigerous gentry, gentry that have the right to bear coat armour, um, and they will be the higher up gentry that will tend to be knighted and that kind of thing. Um, and eventually, by the way, in about 1610, King James introduced the baronetcy, which is a hereditary knighthood, which was then above a knight, uh, b b below, a, a, below a, a peer of the realm. Um, uh, so you get the, 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 the sort of the higher gentry, if you like, and then you get the lower gentry. Uh, these are people that are gentlemen almost by public acclaim, the non-armigerous gentry, the untitled gentry, but they live the life of a gentleman. They own lots of land and they don't need to work. 
and so they are acknowledged by society as being gentlemen and they use the title gentleman. And you'd get cases of the visitations, the heraldic visitations, that people would pretend to have coats of arms they weren't entitled to. They would go around seeing that everyone was using coats of arms properly and if somebody was proclaiming they were a gentleman and it was felt that they weren't, then they would be disgraced in public and they would, they, they would be stated that they, they weren't a gentleman. Now, knighthoods um, were originally brought about as a way of you know, an honour and so forth, but it's not like they were an honour now. It was a sort of just a thing that it would be automatic in your family that you would be knighted. Um, and with being a knight, with the, the higher was your ranking, the more was the public service you had to you had to provide, the more was the free service you had to give. So it was very expensive. And so one of the things they had was called distraint of knighthood, where at a coronation or whatever, to raise money, they would knight you. And then as, a, as because you were a knight, you had to give them loads of money. So it was a way of basically raising money. Um, and some could argue that the strain of knighthood was why the Civil War started in England. And you have many cases of people that pay, would rather pay a fine and not be knighted. I have ancestors of, this, of whom this was true, um, than, than be knighted because it cost a lot of money to be a knight and it cost a lot of money to be an esquire and whatever. And so people would rather just say, oh, I'm a gentleman. Now, that these, this, this difference between an esquire and a gentleman, by the way, was never clear. It was never clear cut. It was basically that if you were an armidurous gentleman and you were rich, really rich, then you'd be recognised as an esquire. That, it was something like that. And if you were an armidurous gentleman and you weren't, well, then maybe you were just a gentleman. But it was, it was, it was never it was sort of clear cut. But that's the system. <clears throat> the system in Scotland is very... Is very similar, except that uh, it was in about the 15th century that you get the development of peers of the realm, i.e. House of Lords, Lords of Parliament in Scotland. And the peers of the realm are a, a Viscount, again, passing only to the eldest son, are Viscounts and Earls. Only later do you get the development in Scotland of Dukes and Marquesses and things. But those are it, Viscounts and Earls. Those are the two main groups. So you have the Earls. They are huge landowners. They own massive amounts of land and they're very, very important. Then you have the Viscounts. They own slightly less land and not quite as important. Then you have the barons. Now, in Scotland, the barons were not lords of parliament. They, they did not sit in the Scottish House of Lords. They were below that. But they held all this land. Now, what I referred to earlier as the, uh, the tenants in chief and the Demesne, the Mesne tenants, they were known originally as barons. Uh, more recently, they were known as you know, lords of the manor. But I'm descended from somebody called Odard, first lord of the manor of Dutton who came to England in about 1066. In some documents they say he's a lord of the manor, in others they say he's a baron of the manor. So those words are used interchangeably. And all the word baron originally meant was a means of owning the land, a, 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 in a hierarchy of land holding. So those are the barons in Scotland. Now you may be familiar with my colleague Michael Woodley of Mani, what happened in here, and these things by the way you can buy, you can purchase Scottish baronies, and they do make you a genuine member of the nobility. Now that's a difference with the Scottish nobility. In England, there's a clear distinction between the nobility and the gentry. And some documents will state that, oh, well, the gentry are our kind of lower nobility. And to a great extent, it is true that the, the esquires and, and, the gen and the gentlemen that are midgerous uh, do parallel the what, what you have in Finland, let's say, or Sweden, of the untitled nobility, in the sense that they have a coat of arms, and this makes you nobility on the continent, full stop. Um, and they are basically, and it, the coat of arms is hereditary, and you have to be legitimate, and it basically, it basically is the same as the untitled nobility you get on the continent. But in England, there is this distinction between the nobility and the gentry. In Scotland, that distinction is not so clear-cut, so these barons who have no right to sit in Parliament, are recognised as nobles. And not only that, but because it, it, being a baron is connected to having land, a barony can be bought and sold, and if you buy a barony, then you are noble in Scots law. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, if you buy a state, the ownership of which makes you a baron. Now that's what you have with my colleague Michael Woodley of Manise's father, um, he is Baron or Lord, whatever. He is Baron of Mani, which is in, Aberde in Aberdeenshire. And it's a, it's a bit of land with the, the probably some old castle on it, I don't know. Um, and that's what he, what's, what he purchased. Now, below that, then, below the Baron, is a, a smaller estate where, uh, again, which can be bought and sold, where, which are recognised under Scots law as being lairdships. And if you hold this estate, the Scottish estate, you are a laird.
Now, in that sense, it's similar to the title of a squire. It is a, it is a title of minor nobility, of, of the gentry, as, 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 it, as it were, of, of petty nobility. It's, it's similar to a squire that you, it, you can't, it's, it's, it, it, it means in its traditional meaning, not its modern meaning, where it just, it just is a synonym for mister, but in its traditional meaning, it's, it's, it's an esquire, it's a very low rank of the nobility, below the rank of baron. Essentially, a kind of untitled nobility of Scotland, if you like, equivalent to an esquire, is a laird. And then obviously below that uh, is simply the concept of gentleman, which I applies in Scotland the same way it does in England, which is a, a how do you define a gentleman? It's a person who is sufficiently wealthy that they don't need to work and who has the, the culture and the, the, the way of being as recognised by society of being a gentleman and possibly who has a coat of arms. And then that is one idea that you get as well with the College of Arms, that you shouldn't call yourself a gentleman unless you are have the right to, to use a coat of arms. Now, that's disputed because, of course, there was the concept of, throughout history, we've known this, of the un, un, non armigerous <coughs> gentlemen. These would often be the illegitimate descendants of gentry families because until the 16th, 17th century, a lot of gentry and nobility would have bastards uh, who would be who would be raised as their own and whatever and, and, and recognised as de facto nobility. So, so that's it. So that's the system. So to be a laird, it's a specific rank that is below baron, but above gentleman, whereby you own an estate to which the concept of lairdship is attached. And that is as distinct from the fact that the word laird in Scotland happens to also mean the owner of the land. And of course it's distinct from that, because if it wasn't, then everybody that lived in Scotland would be a laird. There is a difference between owning land in Scotland and owning an estate which renders you legally, in the eyes of the Lord Lion, a laird. So you can, you can buy a lairdship in Scotland. Yes, you could buy an estate which is a lairdship and then you are a laird. But you're not doing that by, <coughs> by buying a sub-parcel of, of a Scottish estate. Not least because a estate can only have one laird. It can't have multiple lairds. So the answer is perfectly simple. You cannot, but these, these square foots of land, whatever that they sell, do not entitle you and do not make you a laird. That's the first thing. But it gets worse. So first of all, the Lord Lion then does not recognise uh, tiny little bits of land. He doesn't recognise those as being Highland estates. He's made this quite clear. And only if he recognises it as being a Highland estate, essentially, can you... Be, you know, realistically even claim to be a laird if it's a large estate. They're not going to recognise small estates. Uh, the second thing is that even Scots law does not recognise tiny parcels of land. You cannot, in Scots law, sell a square foot of land. It's considered a ridiculous, frivolous waste of time. You can't sell such a thing. It doesn't exist. So you do, if you buy this square foot of land from these title companies, you do not own the land. No matter what they say, you do not own the land. It has not been legally conveyed to you. So even if it was the case that, um, that you were a laird, which you're not in the same sense, when you're a laird in the sense that you own some land, but that's meaningless. You're not a laird in the sense that is meant here. Um, even if that was the case, that, yeah, okay, I'm the owner of, a land, I'm the owner of the land and therefore I'm a, I'm a laird via some weird custom, which is a bit like saying I'm the landlord of the local pub and therefore I'm a lord. It's a bit like saying that. Um, or even I'm a lord of the manor. We don't have to get into that, but there are these English titles, lordships of the manor, um, i.e. the mesne tenant, the person that is he's a lord of the manor of somewhere held by feudal right from a greater tenant or from the monarch. And this lordship of the manor comes with the land. Since the 30s, it's been said that you can legally separate the two. So you can sell the land and you can sell the lordship, um, which sometimes comes with certain rights, such as uh, owning the roads or something, whatever, something like that, or the, having to repair the church roof or something. <clears throat> And therefore, it's something that can be bought and sold. Now, those, because of the snob value involved, they go on sale for £20,000. Uh, and you certainly can't just buy them over the internet. But what you have here, then, is even if that was true, that you you did own, uh, you, you, that they could uh, sell you this land, that you, that you were a laird, um, you're not because you can't buy and sell land that, that, that is that small in Scotland. You can't. So actually, you're renting the land. What is the case is that you, you're paying to rent land from this company, except you're not even renting it because Scots law doesn't allow you to rent tiny little meaningless bits of land. So basically you're paying for them to say, we will not build on this land. 
we will not build on this property of yours, this one square foot. And I bet that's not legally something that could be backed up. So you're basically paying for nothing, absolutely nothing. Um, it's, it is simply uh, a scam based on a linguistic homonym, which is that the word laird, as in the title laird, and the word laird, as in owner of the land, except you don't even own the land. So it's us a scam. Let's bury it under a square foot of land. It's over. But, but I do have an idea, which is that, as you know, I, uh, as I can trace my family tree in the uh, legitimate male line back to Odard, first lord of the manor of Dutton. And apparently, according to various documents that are probably nonsense, but anyway, uh, he goes back to a king of Finland to... Um, I think I've got it up here somewhere, yes, to Thori, King of Finland. He is direct, He is descended in the male line from Thori, King of Finland, via the Dukes of Normandy, Now, or via some other line. Now, that being the case, uh, I, I'd like to say that I, I am probably the only person in Finland that can say that they are legitimately descended from a Finnish king, and therefore that uh, I'm going to put my hat in the ring to be King of Finland. Uh, and so if you would like to buy from me a Finnish dukedom, Marquisette, earldom, barony, whatever, I would be absolutely happy to sell you one. I mean, you know, Lord Smith, that has a good ring. Lord Smith of Finland, that has a good ring to it. I like the sound of that. It could be true. Uh, it's reality. It is. You will be a lord. I will see you soon, and goodbye. Hello, hello, hello! The Jolly Heretic is an online public house which meets on Mondays and Thursdays at 7pm UK time, 2pm New York, in which we discuss the kind of based, fearless science which is increasingly expunged from our woke, joke universities. If you would like to help the Jolly Heretic public house, and there are many ways you can do so, please, please, please become one of my patrons on Subscribestar. Also, if you want to, you can donate to the channel uh, using Odyssey and Entropy, and you can also purchase Jolly Heretic merchandise, such as uh, shirts and mugs. All of the links are in the description. Again, I'd be most violently grateful if you could assist the Jolly Heretic Public House, and I will see you all soon, and goodbye!